Guys, great to be here at EHAR 2024. My name's Toby Ayer, I'm a consultant haematologist in Oxford in the UK, and I'm joined by Lydia Scarfo, who is a consultant in Milan. And uh, we're gonna be talking about some of the highlights we've seen at EHAR with a focus on CLL and Richter's. Um, so Lydia, we saw some uh, really interesting um, data with combinations of BTK inhibitor and BCL2 inhibitor, both in first line treated patients and also in the relapsed refractory setting. What were your, what were your highlights from those abstracts? Uh, very interesting data because uh, during this meeting, we have the say, first look at the data of the ARMD of the Sequoia trial, where zanubrutinib was combined with an etotlax in a particularly high risk population of patients carrying 17P deletion or TP53 aberrations. And we see a very high effic efficacy in this uh, hard to treat patient population so I'd say probably the follow-up is still short and we need to see only three patients discontinue treatment and we need to see in the long run if even in this high-risk population we are able to achieve deep responses based on CR and undetectable MRD allowing us to discontinue treatment. What about the combination of zanubrutinib and sorotoclax in the relapse refractory setting from your side, Tommy? Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, sorontoclax is a, is a new BCL2 inhibitor. It's being studied. Um, it's got a shorter half-life, and it looks like a very potent agent. Um, and it's being studied um, as monotherapy in some diseases, but also in combination. And, and here we saw um, data, reasonably mature data, and quite a large number of patients treated with sorontoclax plus zanabrutinib in patients with relapsed CLL. You could, you could have had a prior BTK inhibitor, but you had to be intolerant rather than resistant to it. Um, and nearly 50 patients were, were studied here, and the response rates were excellent, and uh, very few patients had uh, progressed through, through therapy up until now. In fact, only I think one patient hadn't, hadn't um, uh, maintained a response. So it looks like a very active combination, well-tolerated, fairly low rates of, for example, GI toxicity, cytopenias and so forth so it looks a promising combination and we know this is moving forward into a randomized clinical trial going forward so um, the, the combination of xanabrutin and plus sorontoclax as fixed duration therapy is being compared with venetoclax rituximab in a, in a large international randomized clinical trial so that's currently enrolling and we look forward certainly to seeing the results of that in the future um, so what do you think of um, those other, other combinations of BCL2, BTK inhibitors? I think uh, Nit and Jane presented uh, data with venetoclax, abinutuzumab, and the non-covalent BTK inhibitor, pertubrutinib. Um, what, what were your thoughts about that first-line yeah, trial? Uh, absolutely right. Very impressive data, meaning that they reach very deep responses, up to 100% undetectable MRD, as assessed by uh, NGS analysis. So the um, level is 10 to the minus 6. So uh, very uh, favorable uh, responses, but this is associated, in my opinion, with a sort of trade-off in terms of toxicity because you have 30% of patients who had to dose reduce both pirtobrutinib and venetoclax because of satopenia. So I'm wondering if the addition of obinotuzumab is still really needed in this patient population. What's your opinion on that, Toby? Yeah, I think we're, we're sort of at a bit of a, a crossroads in CLL where we're not quite sure whether triplets have a role versus doublets in terms of CD20, BTK, BCL2 versus perhaps, well, either BCL2, um, CD20 or BTK, B BCL2. And, and you're right, there's this trade-off of toxicity and efficacy. I think clearly that study had very high rates of undetectable MRD. Probably a bit of about adding quite a lot to that, but it was a very fit young group of patients, and you always need to think about the broader applicability of a, of a, of a combination and a triplet regime. And we haven't seen that sort of make its way into our routine clinical practice, have we? So we'll need randomized clinical trial data and long follow up before I think we make that decision and move towards triplet therapy, in, in my opinion. While for the combination of pirtobrutinib plus venetoclax in first line, we are uh, eagerly awaiting the start of the CLL18 trial, where pirtobrutinib plus venetoclax uh, fixed duration or based on an MRD-driven approach will be compared with the standard of care venetoclax plus obinotuzumab. So this would probably provide some additional insight 
insights on uh, this think combination. That, that will provide some really interesting results, answering a number of questions actually, MRD driven strategy versus fixed duration, and then also the question about how those regimes fare with uh, a standard of care that we have at the moment, venetoclax, abinutuzo. Yes, I, I, I think I'd double it particularly with venetoclax and, and, and pertubrutin, which we know to be a very well tolerated BTK inhibitor, cer certainly looks attractive to study. So we'll be waiting the results of that with interest. What about uh, relapsed refractory patients? Are there any new agents uh, you found interesting uh, during this meeting? Yeah, so, I mean, we've seen just new agent after new agent in the last 10 years we've been very spoilt and it's been fantastic to see the developments and i think we have a new class of drug that we've seen very interesting data from at this congress so uh, the btk degraders have been uh, assessed or an, and are ongoing in in early phase clinical trials um, these agents uh, are specifically designed proteins that um, that then bind to BTK and lead to ubiquitinization and degradation by the proteasome. So you, you, you degrade the whole of BTK, including scaffolding around BTK. So they, they work differently to both covalent and non-covalent BTK inhibitors. And we've seen data from two companies, from the Nurex uh, company and also from Biogene, from uh, early data from their phase one um, studies. Uh, the, the groups of patients studied with these um, oral molecules are very heavily pretreated. Lots of patients have had multiple prior lines of therapy, um, high risk genomic characteristics, including BTK mutations, and nearly all patients have been exposed to a prior covalent BTK inhibitor. And there are, in fact, some patients in these studies that have been exposed to BCL2 inhibitors, covalent BTK inhibitors, and indeed non covalent BTK inhibitors. So, very heavily pretreated patients. Um, both the agents look pretty well tolerated, I think, in the two studies. Um, no hugely concerning toxicities. You do see BTK-related toxicities that we're sort of used to from covalent BTK inhibitor and non-covalent BTK inhibitor data. Um, but I, I would say the response rates look pretty, pretty equivalent with the two, two agents in the post-covalent BTK-treated patients. Response rates are about 70%. A very encouraging early data. We of course need long follow-up and a good understanding about um, about the different subgroups and how the treatment fares and how durable these responses are. But I, I personally thought very interesting data and look forward to seeing more with the development of these two agents. Um, I you totally want? agree, if I may, and uh, to the short of follow-up uh, is uh, still uh, uh, difficult to assess the long-term disease control and the interesting uh, and potential great advantage is they seem to work even in the presence of different BTK mutations uh, and they lead to BTK degradation in uh, uh, more than 100% uh, of molecules, so it's a very effective potential mechanism of action. So, as you said, we need long-term follow-up uh, and probably larger patients cohort. And I think a really key question is about the sort of strategic development of these molecules moving forward. The nature of their, their, their activity and their actions suggests that probably you would want to use them sort of after covalent BTK inhibitors certainly have stopped working. Who knows, maybe after non-covalent BTK inhibitors or maybe they'll compete with non-covalent BTK inhibitors. I don't know what your thoughts are um, in that regard. Uh, that's a $1 million question, I'd say. Um, I mean, so far we have data on the sequence starting from covalent BTK inhibitor, then going to non-covalent, and then we have preliminary efficacy and safety data on BTK degrader, but generally, very effective drugs should be used earlier. So if the efficacy, if the promising efficacy results uh, are confirmed uh, in the long run, probably we should design trials uh, where we consider the use of this drug earlier, probably combined with something else uh, in order to use fixed duration combinations anyhow. Yeah. Very interesting. So w watch this space with these agents. And, and Lydia, just to finish, I, I, I think there was some very interesting data just switching tact um, on Richter transformation. This is clearly a, a very feared complication of CLL, uh, a disease that we struggle with in our clinical practice. And um, clearly we need newer agents in this setting. But we saw some interesting data uh, with the bispecific, the CD3, CD20 bispecific epcaritamab 
Um, we'd seen some previous data with this agent before, but there was a much larger cohort presented here. What did you make of that data? Uh, yeah, actually this meeting they presented the fully recruited cohort of the patient with rectal transformation and confirmed an overall response rate of around 60%. That is very impressive in this highly refractory patient population. Um, the efficacy was actually associated with a tolerable safety profile, meaning that as expected patients experience CRS and uh, in small percentage also neurotoxicity, but uh, they were manageable. Um, again, probably we should better understand uh, with the longer follow-up the duration of response. Uh, as mentioned, this was a very uh, heavily pretreated patient population, uh, previously exposed to treatment for both uh, CLL and uh, Richter transformation. Um, and we have also to consider that in the future cohort of the study, uh, Ipcoritamabi will be explored in combination with other treatments. On one side, there is a cohort recruiting patients uh, uh, who will be treated with Ipcoritamab and RCHOP. And a uh, second cohort I found very interesting is the combination of Ipcoritamab and immune modulator, modulator lenalidomide. So I'm looking forward also to these uh, additional cohorts in order to better understand if we can achieve long-term disease control in Richter. I completely agree and I think one of the really interesting things here about this monotherapy data is that these are the highest complete remission rates we've really seen with, with, a, with a monotherapy in, in Richter transformation. The question would be how strategically do you combine these agents? What's the best treatment? Should you go completely chemotherapy free or does chemotherapy still have a role in these patients? Lots of interesting questions but certainly bispecific antibodies look very active here. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining me, Lydia, and I hope that was of interest, and uh, thank you for listening.